My father was a rock star. It was like Beatlemania. But not here in America. Dean Reed criticized the American government from behind the Iron Curtain. He had lots of enemies. You communist pinko. He wanted to come back home. And then the unthinkable happened. Dean Reed died. Come with me, Ramona Reed, to learn more about the extraordinary life and mysterious death of a revolutionary. Listen to Red Elvis, a Curiosity Audio Network podcast on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Dana Schwartz, host of Stealing Superman, a new iHeart original podcast about the most unlikely art heist of all time. It was Nick Cage's own personal national treasure. At a 1999 New Year's Eve party, someone snatched Cage's priceless comics. But who? Listen to Stealing Superman on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your favorite shows. Hi, it's Bethany Frankel. My time on The Real Housewives of New York is a few years behind me, and now I'm ready to put the real back into The Real Housewives. That's where my new podcast, Rewives, comes in. This isn't your typical rewatch podcast. I'm bringing on unexpected thought leaders and celebrities to give their take on the chaos. In my first episode, I dig into the Scary Island Rony episode with Elizabeth Moss. It's one of my favorite shows I've ever done, so don't miss it. Listen to Rewives with Bethany Frankel on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. I won't let my body outweigh, outweigh everything that I'm made of. Won't spend my life trying to change. I'm learning to love who I am. I am strong, I feel free I know every part of me is beautiful And I will always outweigh If you feel it, put your hands in the air Show some love to the new while you're there Let's take it one day at a time Cause you and I outweigh Happy Saturday, Outway fam. Amy here. And my expert guest today is Bobby Giudicelli. And Bobby, I know you recently released a book and I'm obsessed with the title because it seems like something that's right up my alley and it's Freedom from a Toxic Relationship with Food, a journey that will give you your life back. And literally that's how I felt once I truly got into recovery. I got my life back and one that who knows that I hadn't had since I was a teenager. Yeah, for sure. Uh, You know, it's interesting you use the word recovery. I don't think I've ever in all my many years used recovery. I've used, I hope one day to be cured. And I never believed I would be. And I did believe it would always be more recovery, although I never used the word. But I will tell you, I honestly feel cured at this point wow. in my life. But I'm in my 60s. And and I wrote my book for those people that don't want to wait until they're in their 50s and 60s to find what recovery and a cure feel like. Well, so for you, when did your disordered behavior or your eating disorder start? How many years were you living with it? Uh, From age 18 until age, I would say my journey to health began 10, 11 years ago. So from age 18 until age 56, and it was excruciating. And I had always said, and to this day, I am fully 100% committed to guiding, being with, supporting anybody to uh, prevent them from having to live that many years with the struggle that it is. And so I know one of the things you're passionate about is dieting and why it doesn't work. Diets are in our face, and even diets in disguise are in our face all the time. But in your opinion. Why do you think diets don't work? Well, first of all, they don't address the problem. And the the problem is our relationship with food. The problem is our relationship and our perspective on ourselves, our bodies, how we feel. And then separately, we all live a life with a relationship with food because food is a necessity in our life. I always say that if you're an alcoholic, that is an easy, easier recovery. I believe I was never an alcoholic, but I believe it's an easier recovery because you can eliminate alcohol from your life and be 
healthier and sustain and so on. When your issue is a relationship with food, you cannot remove food from your life and be healthy. You just can't. I mean, anorexics try that and they either die or they go down the path of some sort of re-entering a relationship with food or, or bringing food into their life. But diets don't work because that's one of the reasons they don't address the relationship with food. Number two, we constantly feel deprived. We look at a diet as a short-term solution. Let me just lose the 10, 20, 50, 100 pounds, and then I will be fine. And then I don't have to deprive myself anymore. So that's reason number two. We cannot keep food in our life with constant deprivation. Number three, they don't work because the foods that we, that are the majority of foods in our supply system, especially the ones that are packaged that say they are healthy are not. And they create a, an addiction to the food, the, the ingredients, the, the way food is made, the processed food is addicting. Whether it's sugar, it's salt, it's the uh, chemicals that are introduced, we get addicted. And so therefore you go, okay, I'm going to diet, which means for the next X number of weeks, I can't eat cake. Well, okay, you're not eating cake, but you're eating, continuing to eat sugar. When you decide to stop dieting, the sugar itself is driving you, is driving your cravings, it's driving your addiction. And you go right back to not just eating the unhealthy foods, but consuming them even in greater quantity. Well, so for me, I started dieting at a very young age and my brain wasn't fully <laughs> developed. And I wired it to binge on food because it was so deprived that it didn't trust me. So when I would allow myself to eat, it was uncontrollable. I would just find myself eating and eating and eating because my brain was like, oh, I better eat all that I can right now because I don't know when this person's going to feed me again. And so it was a, a, my survival brain kicking in. So that deprivation, I definitely can relate to. And then how my body and my brain responded to that. And then the types of foods. I feel like for me, the pendulum has swung. When I first started to eliminate my eating disorder and work towards my recovery, I feel like I was allowing all kinds of foods because that's what I needed to sort of rewire my brain. Like, oh, the as if method, like, oh, I'm going to act as if this is normal and I can eat whatever I want and allow it. And the pendulum swung so far. And I feel like that's what we see too a lot on social media, which can be a dangerous place for recovery because you can get information that's not very helpful. But then I just want your thoughts on this pendulum thing. Like I swung all the way to the other side where every food was on the table. And really it still is. But I think that the pendulum has leveled out because I also have knowledge of food and what is in it and the wisdom to want to nourish my body well if I were to just allow all foods at all times, I know I'm not going to wake up and feel my best. And I also want to take care of all of my organs and know the foods that are going to be nourishing to them and foods that are going to be toxic to my organs. So while everything's allowed, I do think that there's, there's this balancing act that kind of happens. So wherever you are on this journey, just know that I think it it might swing, but it's true. Sometimes when I swung too far, I kept craving that stuff more and more and more because I was having it all the time. So so one of the things most people don't understand is that that is not happening in your brain, actually. It's initiated in your gut. It's initiated in your microbiome. Your entire, what they call dysbiosis, but it's the imbalance of the proper bacteria in your gut, which controls everything. It controls our digestion. It controls our immune system. It controls... You know, it controls everything that happens in our body that is so critical. And we are constantly feeding it either good things that will promote the good bacteria or bad things that will promote the bad bacteria. And so that when you say the pendulum swings all the way to one side, what's really happening is you've created an environment in your gut that the bacteria itself is telling you and signaling you to eat 
that particular thing, be it sugar, sugar is an easy example because most of us can relate. What most people don't know is dairy and cheese specifically are also extremely addictive. So you'll hear people say a lot of times, I can't give up cheese. I can't give up uh, sugar. I can't give up salt. What they don't understand is, yes, indeed, they can't because their body is constantly craving that because they've set up the environment. When I started my journey 12, 11, whatever years ago, I did not believe that I would ever be recovered, I that I would ever be have a healthy relationship with food to look forward to going to a grocery store or look forward to preparing a meal, which I hadn't done for years. I, I married a man who loved to cook. And so he cooked and we raised three boys with him doing all the cooking because I was petrified to be in the kitchen. Food and, and eating and meals and eating outside of meals was a very chaotic experience for me. Um, and I think one thing that's really important for your audience, I know I'm straying kind of from uh, the original question that you asked me, but I think one thing that's really important for your audience to understand is if there is chaos in your relationship with food, you have disordered eating, minimally disordered eating. I mean, eating disorders from technically what's considered an eating disorder is, is more complex than that. If it's noisy, I can only explain it as very noisy in my head every time I would eat. So I would eat and it would be a constant balance of oh my God, how many calories? Oh my God, there's too much fat. I can get more calories if I get less fatty foods. If I'm going to eat that chocolate cake, that means I can't eat for two more days. If I want to fit in that dress in two weeks, that means I better stop eating completely. I mean, it's noisy. So something that I would tell you, like when people say I can't give up X, Y, Z, let's take ice cream. I can't give up ice cream. You know, you hear people say that all the time. And the thing is that then they'll eat the ice cream and there's noise in their head because they know they shouldn't be eating it. But OK, they've made an agreement with themselves. They'll only eat one scoop. OK, they'll only eat two spoon spoonfuls. Now, what are they going to have to do? Run three extra miles tomorrow to counterbalance the impact of that. So if you have that kind of noise in your head, there is disordered eating at play. You know, if you're constantly looking for what's the answer, what's the next book, what's the next support group, what's the next whatever, because I can't live like this anymore. I can't live with three sizes of clothes in my closet. I can't live with feeling like I have no energy. I just can't live like that anymore. You have disordered eating. And there is, as the title of my book, the subtitle of my book says, there is a journey that gives you your life back. I am here to tell you, I never believed I would be saying this, but I love food. I have no negative impact when I eat, when I think about eating, when I plan what I'm eating. I'm 67 years old. I never believed I would ever be able to say that. And I don't want other people to wait until they're in their 60s to say that. I don't either. And, you know, at 41, I feel as though, gosh, so many years were were wasted, but it, it I, I want to say that like something, there was some benefit for that in my life of like, what has this made possible for me now? I don't want to look back and focus on the past. Like I want to see maybe it's so that I could come alongside and help others that are going through this and have this podcast. I, I don't know. So I don't want to harp on the past at all, but I do do wish I would have entered or been exposed to this type of thinking or recovery or knowing that there's hope for it when I was 31, 21, because there's so many family meals that I missed or memories to be made or times where I could have been engaging in conversation with someone. But like you said, my brain was full of all kinds of noise and other thoughts. So I wasn't fully present. And Lisa, who is a registered dietitian and friend of mine, Lisa Heyman, she's the one that originally co-founded Outway with me. She has a whole program called Fork the Noise. So I love that you called it noise because that's exactly what it is. And when we started this podcast, it's Outway, a life without disordered eating outweighs everything. But we also were very adamant of like, the, we're covering the gray area. Like this whole topic is not black and white. 
My father was a rock star. It was like Beatlemania. But not here in America. Living behind the Iron Curtain, Dean Reed criticized the American government and preached peace. But it all came at a cost. There were bomb threats and death threats. Everywhere he went. He comes into the view of the Stasi. He is arrested by the secret police. The CIA is worrying about it. Without a doubt. He had millions of adoring fans. Dean Reed, you're icy. And also lots of enemies. You communist pinko. As the Soviet Union was starting to crumble, he made a big announcement. I'm an American. He wanted to come back home. And then the unthinkable happened. Dean Reed died. There were so many questions and so few answers. He had been assassinated. He committed suicide. Come with me, Ramona Reed, to learn more about the extraordinary life and mysterious death of a revolutionary. Listen to Red Elvis, a Curiosity Audio Network podcast, starting December 7th on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, it's Bethany Frankel. My time on The Real Housewives of New York is a few years behind me, and now I'm ready to put the real back into The Real Housewives. That's where my new podcast, Rewives, comes in. This isn't your typical rewatch podcast. I'm watching only the most iconic episodes from all cities. I'm sharing never-before-heard stories of what happened behind the scenes. And I'm not just pulling in cast members for post-game analysis. I'm doing something a little more interesting. If you've ever seen an episode of The Real Housewives, you know the drill. But beyond throwing drinks and legs, there are lessons about marriage, divorce, friendship, money, parenting, and fame. If you have the right minds, analyze and dig deeper. So I'm bringing on unexpected thought leaders and celebrities to give their take on the chaos. This season, I sit down with Elizabeth Moss, Kevin Nealon, Susie Orman, Griffin Johnson, and more. You'd think that there isn't much to learn from flipping tables and yanking wigs, but that's where you're wrong. Listen to Rewives with Bethany Frankel on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. I'm Dana Schwartz, host of Stealing Superman, a new iHeart original podcast about the most unlikely art heist of all time. Not just because of what was stolen, but from whom? It was Nick Cage's own personal national treasure. He likes his weird crypts. He likes his comic books. That's who he is, and that's what he likes. And it's so different than other very famous rich people. It was like this gothic mansion, but it also had like twists and turns. It was like a museum. So it doesn't shock me that something walked off from that house, if it did. Why did he go to a dealer? If you do that, then it will just prove beyond any reasonable doubt that this person is telling a pack of lies. It just feels like another world, right? Like, it feels like fiction because someone targeted this very specific, very talented actor and stole something that is very specific to his interests. Listen to Stealing Superman on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your favorite shows. There's so much happening here. And there's so many different types of people that can be coming to the table here. And I love having people on, especially that have amazing resources like you do with freedom from a toxic relationship with food. I love that title so much. And then I love the journey that will give you your life back because that's truly what happens once you can have a cure or into recovery, whatever you want to call it. And it doesn't happen overnight. Mine It was a journey and I feel like I'm still working on it, but the noise is less and less and less and less. And I like the ice cream example too that you gave because I was talking about the pendulum and it's like when I wasn't allowing it, I wanted it more and more and more and then I allowed it and then the pendulum evens out because then it's less desirable and you're like, oh, my pendulum evened out and now I can keep ice cream in the fridge for weeks and months and I don't feel like I have to throw it away or eat it all in one night. It'll literally be there for months at a time. Isn't that amazing? Yes, I, I still relate to what you're saying. For me, it's, I explain it a little differently and I am kind of a, I'm going to say, and I use this term loosely, not technically, not medically, but I'm an OCD person. I work better when I build tight boundaries around something that's important to me. So, you know, like no going back. And what I found in my journey, so I did, I did change. I did take a lot of foods out of my day-to-day eating. So I am now whole food plant-based. I eat very little of anything processed. I eat uh, no animal products whatsoever. And, And that's changed my life in other ways outside of food. But for me, 
there was no discussion about, am I going to eat it? Am I go going to eat that chocolate bar? No, because it's processed. I'd not say I don't eat, I make my own dark chocolate with nuts now. And, and I like, love it. But yes, like you said, now I can eat one piece and I, and it lives in my freezer all the time. And I don't, you know, I don't have to eat it. So for me, I needed to to really eliminate certain foods. But what happened for me by eliminating animal products, by eliminating any processed food, is it completely changed my taste buds. And now processed foods don't taste good. Animal products, I used to love meat. And animal products, I can't even imagine eating. Like I just look at it and it does not look appetizing. That's me. That's how it worked for me. I don't believe for anybody to recover um, that they really need to be as extreme. But for me, uh, I did. The other one thing, a uh, point that I really, really want to make is we all, especially women, grow up believing that our weight is critical. Like what we look like, how much we weigh, how our clothes fit. We are told by society, and now it's even worse because of social media, we are told thin is it. I mean, you, you we are driven by our weight. And at the end of the day, we're compromising our health. Dieting compromises our health. Eating disorders and disordered eating compromise our health. And for me, I will tell you, I kind of resigned myself to the fact that I would always carry 10 more pounds than I wanted to until I changed the way I ate. And it was absolutely not motivated by weight. It was motivated by health. My sister died of cancer. My father, last 10, 12 years of his life were horrible. And both of them, I believe, were due to diet. I really do believe that the outcome or their life quality of life would have been different had they eaten differently. And I was ex experiencing extreme, extreme fatigue. And that's when I said this has to do with how I'm eating. And I am here to tell you that I have more energy now in my late 60s than I had at 40. And that is a result of using food as medicine, as what sustains me and not as the crutch and the numbing agent and the drug that I used it as. My mom actually passed away from cancer. And that's when my eating disorder came back with the vengeance. And it was literally to numb out. Yeah. And it stuck around for a while, even while my dad was diagnosed with cancer. So I, I appreciate you writing this book and giving it as a guide to so that those of us that are in recovery are looking to get rid of that noise in our head, but also be mindful of what we're putting in our body for overall health, because disease does scare me because I watched, I was a caregiver for both of my parents and it was, I don't know it for sure if their diet would have played a different role, but I know that I'm still young enough to where maybe if I start to do certain things for my body and my organs and feed it a certain way or feed it certain things that I can, I can be as proactive as possible. No, it's not guaranteed to eliminate chronic disease. Absolutely not. However, your overall quality of life, your energy. I mean, if you are somebody that's eating a lot of processed food, I guarantee you your energy is impacted. It, it just is. It has to be. It's the way your body works. If you're getting sick frequently, if you're getting colds frequently, it has to do with the way you are eating. And yes, it doesn't mean that you can eat however you want, then you start to get a cold and you get a plug yourself with vitamin C. No, that's not taking care of yourself. Your overall immune system is impacted. And, and this is only recently that they understand this all comes from what you put in your body. So, and I truly believe this, everything you eat is either helping you have a better quality of life or negatively impacting your quality of life and your overall health. And I really, really believe that. And the other thing I really want to stress, though, is what I mentioned about your taste buds. What people don't get is not only can you give it up, and, and I really go through the steps in my book of what that journey looks like. It's not only can you give it up, but you're not going to miss it. 
at some point because food takes on a whole new look. Like I couldn't walk past chocolate without eating it uh, in my earlier days. It doesn't do anything for me now. Looking at it doesn't do anything. If I decide I want to have a piece of the chocolate that I make, which probably happens once a month, I get a piece of chocolate. That is good for me because it's, first of all, very healthy chocolate. It's dark chocolate. It has minimal sugar. And the cacao is very healthy for you. It's an antioxidant. And it has nuts in it. So there's more protein and healthy fats. I know, like, just because I roll up my sleeves and learn about things in detail, I know everything that I eat, what it's doing for me. And it helps me have an appetite for it. And like I said, my taste buds are different. I couldn't eat milk chocolate now if you wanted me to. It just doesn't taste right. I can't eat processed food. It, if I eat something processed, sometimes I'll go to a restaurant and I'll go, oh, I can taste that. That does not taste good to me. And I don't eat it. Do you have a different recipes anywhere? Are there some in the book or on your website or this? I'm curious about this chocolate recipe. <laughs> no, I don't have recipes. I'm more than happy to share it with you. Um, I don't have recipes because I don't like cooking with recipes. What I do is I uh, and I had to learn it because I've never cooked before. And my husband does not did not change the way he eats. So now I do cook every single night, but I throw things together like I know foods that I like and I. And I just experiment with stuff that I know is healthy, different, you know, herbs and spices. And and I only recently started loving tofu because I throw it together with something and, and put it in my air fryer. And I went, oh, my God, this I used to really dislike tofu for a vegan. That's a problem. Um, now I, you know, really like it. It's like, I just, I love the exploration and yeah. So no, and I'll never write a cookbook because I'd be the worst person in the world to write a cookbook. I, I would just have to say, well, throw that in, throw that in. I do look at recipes online and go, oh, that's a good idea. And I don't follow the measurements. I just throw that in and throw that in. But it's fun. And and I'm telling you, I'm somebody who used to be petrified to walk into a grocery store or petrified at the prospect that I had to make dinner that night because my husband wouldn't be home and I had three kids that needed to eat. That ended up being pizza night. Um, I couldn't handle it any other day. And pizza was one of my weak foods. So that would mean a night I was overeating. So, yeah, it's it's just a different world. But I do want to leave you with, I wrote the book to support anyone, anyone who wants the support and would like the support for exploring a different way. And I make myself very available to anybody who reads the book or sees this podcast or whatever to support them, because I, I probably have a lot of knowledge that even some standard nutritionists don't have. Well, Freedom from a Toxic Relationship with Food, a journey that will give you your life back is available on Amazon. I'll link it in the show notes, but you can visit foodfreedomadvocate.com for more about Bobby. But thank you so much for, for sharing some of your story with us. I know that everybody's on a different journey, but I think ultimately we want to get our lives back, whatever that that looks like. So thank you for sharing your journey with us and what it's looked like for you and the tools that have worked for you and helping us get rid of the noise. Everybody's got their different ways. And yeah, if you're thinking you've got the noise and this sounds like something that you would be into, I personally am going to order the book because I'm very interested in nourishing my body with different types of food. I think that I've kind of gotten in a little bit of a rut, but that's okay. I also don't have any shame with that or guilt. Like I'm doing the best that I can with life right now, but I'm open to all different kinds of things. So thank you, Bobby, for sharing your book with us. Oh, you're so welcome. And it was such a pleasure to be here. And I just, uh, I think food should be a joyful part of our life. And for many of us, that's a challenge, but that's what my goal is for anybody else because it is joyful. And thank you again for having me. Absolutely. My 
father was a rock star. It was like Beatlemania. But not here in America. Dean Reed criticized the American government from behind the Iron Curtain. He had lots of enemies. You communist pinko. He wanted to come back home. And then the unthinkable happened. Dean Reed died. Come with me, Ramona Reed, to learn more about the extraordinary life and mysterious death of a revolutionary. Listen to Red Elvis, a Curiosity Audio Network podcast on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, it's Bethany Frankel. My time on The Real Housewives of New York is a few years behind me, and now I'm ready to put the real back into The Real Housewives. That's where my new podcast, Rewives, comes in. This isn't your typical rewatch podcast. I'm bringing on unexpected thought leaders and celebrities to give their take on the chaos. In my first episode, I dig into the Scary Island Rony episode with Elizabeth Moss. It's one of my favorite shows I've ever done, so don't miss it. Listen to Rewives with Bethany Frankel on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. I'm Dana Schwartz, host of Stealing Superman, a new iHeart original podcast about the most unlikely art heist of all time. It was Nick Cage's own personal national treasure. At a 1999 New Year's Eve party, someone snatched Cage's priceless comics. But who? Listen to Stealing Superman on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your favorite shows.